Good evening and a warm welcome to the Oxford Martin School. I'm absolutely delighted this evening to welcome uh, Sonia Contera here. Sonia, can you turn that one off? Thank you. Uh, this is being webcast and recorded, so let's just hear Sonia uh, rather than someone else and me. Uh, delighted to welcome uh, Sonia Contero, who's been associated with the Oxford Martin School since 2008. When I was um, the director, we created a program on nanomedicine with Sonia and another Sonia, Sonia Trigueros. Um, and it's illustrative of the fact that the Oxford Martin School works on absolutely tiny issues uh, in terms of size, not importance, like nano, and Sonia will describe just how tiny they are, the nanoparticles, and those which are in scale are uh, universal, like cosmology. Uh, and that is indicative of the breadth and depth of what we do. But all the issues are of huge relevance to the future of humanity. And certainly, uh, I've become convinced that nano and nanomedicine that Sonia works on uh, is one such issue. Sonia's been absolutely pioneering in this. Um, she's an associate professor of biological physics. She'll explain to you what that is um, in the university and created a lab uh, which, when I was fortunate enough to be able to visit it and saw nano through a force atomic microscope, uh, blew my mind, and I'm sure she will, all of you. She's here this evening to launch her new book, uh, Nano Comes to Life, published by Princeton University Press, and we're delighted also that she'll be able to sign copies of the book afterwards, which are for sale, uh, and have a drink uh, with anyone that's interested in the back. So uh, thanks to you all for coming, and particularly thanks to Sonia for giving us this opportunity to, to hear how Nano Comes to Life. Thank you, Ian. As I said, in the acknowledgments of the book, uh, I think the origins of the book actually comes from the ideas I, uh, I got working for the Oxford Martin School and the opportunities that they gave me many years ago to engage with the public and with the wider uh, uh, audiences that were interested in the science I was developing. And I could have not, I think, come to this book without having been a member of the Martin School before. So let's start with this picture. Uh, for many of you, uh, Biology, at least a lot of the biology that you come in the press looks like something like that. Uh, if, uh, or at least the promise that the press and, and the media show about biology at the moment. We have a more or less male hand manipulating our DNA and linking bits of DNA, which I expect they, it looks like a base, but for this picture is like a gene to our intelligence and the color of our eyes. This picture has no scientific foundation, uh, and the history why we arrived to this place is important for the story I'm going to tell you today. So, for most of the 17th century, 18th century, 19th century, and 20th century, science, especially physics, and, uh, was interested in looking at the constituents of matter, what matter was made of. And the microscopes were invented, importantly, uh, Robert Hooke here in Oxford, was one of the pioneers of microscopy, he was the first one to uh, determine that living matter was made of cells. And he called them cells because reminded them of the places of the little cells where the, where the monks used to uh, live in, uh, in, in and the nuns used to live in convents. That's why cells are called cells. Now, the story continues of people looking into the constituents of biological matter. Uh, we've always been obsessed with ourselves and what we are made of. And how can we use that for medicine? We want to cure ourselves uh, for technology. And of course, for our social and political purposes, all this information is very complex. So we arrive in the 1950s to the point where the molecules that make life finally become visible to humans. So um, for most of uh, the 20th century, the only way you can say, you can see the constituents of biological systems were through X-ray diffraction. So we are made of proteins and DNA and other biomolecules. And these proteins and DNA and biomolecules are made of um, 
Uh, they are nano size. And you can't see that with an optical microscope at all. The only way you can see this is by, uh, because the, the, the light doesn't allow you to see things below 300 nanometers. So um, X-ray diffraction is about throwing X-rays to crystals of molecules, and then by the diffraction of the light that comes on the other side, you can reconstruct the shape of the molecule. The most famous example is DNA. And of course, you all have heard probably of Watson and Crick, who got a Nobel Prize for determining the structure of DNA out of the diffraction patterns of the DNA uh, that, on the experiments that Rosalind Franklin was doing at King's College. This is a very so, uh, complicated story of science politics in which she did the experiments with a student uh, with the samples coming from Switzerland from the DNA of the sweetbreads of Swiss calves. But the Nobel Prize were given by, to the guys that actually didn't do the experiments, but arrived to the lab and got the information and eventually came to the double helix. So this is one of the most studied complex stories of, of gender politics in science, actually, because uh, she, uh, she didn't get the Nobel Prize and she actually died because of the cancer that was produced because of the experiments. So the 1950s was all about getting crystal structures like this one of proteins that were increasingly important to try to construct a picture, uh, to try to understand what were the structures that make life. Um, this is the reason why we have now synchrotrons actually near Oxford, because uh, these synchrotrons can produce very powerful X-rays and we can get information, structural information about proteins in crystals that are very small. The problem with this approach is that the way you study your proteins are the constituents of matter are not in the living environment. You extract them, you make a crystal, and then you make these structures. And all this together with genetics and the way we do science in the 20th century uh, has produced a picture of biology in which you have many little bits that are interconnected and we have absolutely no rationale to understand all this. This has promoted an idea of biology that tells you that you have DNA. From DNA, you produce protein. And the most simple interpretation you can do of DNA, of, of biology, is like, I'll try to understand DNA. And from DNA, you understand everything you need to know about biology. Uh, so our body also says, the theory, you have DNA, and then the proteins we read it in it, we create more proteins, and then we are built by the information that is inside our genes, and there's nothing we can do about it. So this, is a re this composes a landscape with many other sciences in the 20th century, which is called the reductionist vision of the world, in which we look at the world by the building blocks. Is DNA, and DNA makes proteins, and the interactions of the proteins makes us. And if we could know more or less how these things interact with each other, we could, we could create or understand how we work. Uh, this has been also the basis of the development of technology in the 20th century. We will look at atoms and the interactions between atoms, and we will create technologies based on this idea that if you look into the world, you will find bits, and by the interactions of the bit, you can come up with ideas that you can start fabricating transistors or medicine. In medicine, this means that most of the efforts of medicine in the 21st century was to create drugs that could even bind proteins of DNA to block the process from happening. So if you have a disease, is because there's some protein went wrong. And the reason why it went wrong is because some of your genes is not functioning the way it would. So it's a linear chain in which if you stop either the protein or the DNA, you will stop the disease. This was also very interesting for many political agendas, especially during colonialism, that used DNA and Darwinism to say there's some people better than others. And we could classify people by their genetics and know who is better and who is worse. Um, so in the 20th century, really, the idea that everything was building blocks and that we could interact with building blocks and produce all our technology was the dominant. Uh, the problem with that is that um, pharmaceutical companies were reaching a point where they were not and still now developing new drugs. The drugs they developed are not always effective. Um, the reason for this is that, for example, when you have a cancer and you find your chemotherapy for drug, the drug may or may not reach the tumor. And when it reaches the tumor, the cells deals with this drug. Uh, initially, you kill the cell, but other cells will evolve. And after a few months, their cells become resistant to your drug. So biology doesn't actually, and nature doesn't actually work 
in a reductionist way. And we know that we are able, all our building blocks, when they come together, they create very complex beings. We are able to think, we are always, we are able to, to feel. So things have started to change, and this is the beginning of nanotechnology in the 1980s, uh, when the first uh, instruments that would allow to see matter at the nanometer scale, atoms one by one, or matter at the nanometer scale, appear. So these are images of the scanning tunnel in microscope. When you see here is the surface of copper, and when you see here are the atoms of, iron, atoms of iron sitting on top. So these microscopes allow you to see atoms one by one. And what this guy did, Don Eigler and IBM, was to learn how to pick up with the scanning tunnel and microscope these uh, atoms and arrange them in a circle. And this is the first time humans are able to build anything, atoms one by one. And uh, what you see in the middle is a ripple is because the electrons are in the metal and they run freely here. They cannot run freely inside the quantum coral, as he called it. They form a ripple, which is, is a, real, a visualization of the uh, uh, quantum mechanics. Particles behave as waves as well as particles. And another thing you see here is that the reductionism I tell you before. Most of the 20th century, what people wanted to do with technology was to build things using building blocks. But you also see that nature is reacting in a complicated way. Nature doesn't produce single atoms moving around, produces a wave. This is what we call an emergent phenomena. So in nature, the interactions of building blocks don't give rise to more building blocks like Lego. They can build really complex behaviors, and life is one such complex behavior. So using these techniques, which is I'm part of, I'm one of the I'm a scanning probe microscopes, we started to become interested not only in studying atoms and nanomachines made of metals, but we started to become interested in how nature created uh, the best nanomachines that we know of proteins. Um, so by the 1980s, we had a starting to get information from crystal structures that proteins will have very complicated structures that let people think that they will also work at nanomachines. The breakthroughs, again, started to come in in the 1980s, where people started to see how our proteins were not just doing chemistry. You know, we have this vision of biology in which proteins just bind to chemicals and produce chemical reactions. But actually, these chemical reactions were catalyzed or driven by nanomachines. This is perhaps the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful nanomachines. This is the ATP synthase. You have kilograms of those in your body uh, because they are responsible of producing ATP, a molecule that turns around that we need for all our chemical reactions. So. ATP is not produced in, a, in the body like in a, in a test tube you would do. It's produced by this nanomachine. It's, it's a, a tiny thing that sits in the membranes of your mitochondria, sucks protons, the protons move this, makes it rotate, and that moves the top. So when the top moves, binds ATP, and is able to churn proteins. Why is that? Because at the nanoscale, you're so small, that when you bind a, a molecule, you bind it, you stretch it. When you move, you stretch it. So you make the electrons jump. So the key to biology at the nanoscale is that you couple mechanics with chemistry and electrostatic to produce maximum efficiency. So doing this like this, you produce ATP in kilograms, 60 kilograms a day in your body. Not if you were going to do it in this bucket, it would take you a really long time. But you do it constantly because you are able to use mechanics to churn out. Uh, this was discovered by Hiroyuki Noji, who was the first one who ever proved that this thing rotates. The atomic force microscopes that I use allows us for the first time to see proteins, the proteins sitting in your membranes one by one, or DNA, like here, which is not the beautiful molecule that comes from X-ray diffraction, but a complex tangle, very twisted, full of energy, full of mechanical energy. And that mechanical energy is the one that allows it to interact with the outside world and with proteins around it. And indeed, our microscopes allow us to see proteins moving in real time. These are microscopes that are showing you the movement of our molecular motors. Let me show you this one here. This is myosin. Myosin is another protein that is in every living system, and it sits in your cells in acting filaments, some proteins that act like track. The cell is so crowded 
that it cannot just relay on things moving around. So this thing that is able to walk on the track moves things around your cell. Um, the reason why biology works and this is one of the questions we were starting to do with our microscopes as such efficiency, is because it couples in its structure the capacity to produce function. So the, one of the main things I tell in my book is that there's a moment where um, nanotechnologies really start to change biology. Yes, when we start to see molecules like this. So the people that took these movies were mainly physicists and engineers. And what they cared were not interested in these maps of the biology, so the DNA of the interaction between molecules. We're interested in why and how can you create something like that? Why evolution chose these structures to create our lives? And how does this work? So they had an engineering thinking about this. The reason that this works is because when you're so small, you're at a nanoscale, you feel the water around you. So when the water around you hits you, you are able to use it a bit like a windmill when the, when the wind goes around the wheel, just due to your mechanical structure to produce a movement. So biological molecules are able to use just water and temperature to produce movement and catalyze chemical reactions. So that was the beginning of bio nanotech, in my opinion. And, and then other people, like Eric Dressler, who is now associated also to the Martin School, were important in this story because they started to create the narrative of nanotechnology. He created a very influential book, Engines of Creation, where he, pre he predicted the things we're actually doing now in the lab. And at the same time, chemists and material scientists were starting to be able to create artificial structures with DNA. So in the 1980s, we have, on the one hand, the physicists coming with the tools to understand biology, to see why biology builds itself on the nanoscale, chemists and material scientists building nanomaterials, and a confluence of all these sort of sciences trying to understand why biology happens at the nanoscale and how can we deal with it. So one of the first things nanotechnologists did was, OK, uh, now we can reach the nanoscale. How can we use this to improve medicine? So the first attempts of nanomedicine were about bringing drugs better to tumors. So uh, when you have a tumor, you need to put very high concentrations of drugs in order for the drugs to be effective killing the tumor. The reason is because the drugs, the reasons why we have such big side effects is because in order to the drugs to reach in enough concentration the tumor, you need to raise the concentration so much that it actually kills you. So actually it was a Japanese scientist who discovered also just before the 1990s that nanoparticles and nanostructures would accumulate in tumors. So everybody thought the reason for that is because tumors, when they grow, they from these veins around them to feed themselves. And these veins have a lot of holes. They are not perfect. And things like nanoparticles can go through them and accumulate. So people have spent the last 30 years building nanoparticles to reach tumors and try to kill them. There are many ways they're trying to do this. They put chemicals on the nanoparticles. They put magnetic uh, properties in the nanoparticles. So then you can use a magnetic field to heat them up and then kill the tumor by heating it up. Others are able to absorb light. The problem with all this effort is that it relied pretty much in finding the tumor in, an, in a non, uh, non very specific way. There was no uh, mathematical modeling. There was no thinking. It was just trying to find a magic bullet that will kill the tumor. Very few nanoparticles have been approved for use in medicine. Actually, very, very few. And the, the field has got stuck, mainly because of the same reasons that pharmacology has got stuck. Uh, they were trying to kill or, or reach the targets without thinking very much, without taking into account the complexity of biology. And so far, although they are very good with mice in the lab or with cell cultures, they haven't reached the promise they produce. One of the main problems is that the body is very good at clearing nanoparticles. So your kidneys and your liver get rid of them. That's why they are there for, because we also evolved with nanoparticles. So, so far, we need to think harder. And the good news, and as I will tell you later, is that people are starting to think harder and collaborate more with mathematicians and computer scientists to get this work to work better. Biosensing was another field that had a lot of promise. The idea that you could have a little paper strip 
with some electric or chemical detection, and you would just put a drop of blood, and you will know everything you have in your blood. This also has failed, because again, people were trying to overstep the complications of biology, as you probably know for the story of Theranos. Even we have a movie of Theranos. People were thinking that this could be a problem that could be solved. It has not been so easy to solve. Good news are is that there's a lot of progress. Last week I heard, I think a Japanese company, Hitachi, announced for the first time a device which is relatively big and complicated, but would allow you to test a lot of molecules detecting a lot of tumors in blood in a single, in a single chip. So things are getting there, but definitely they were not as simple as they were predicted. Again, Koreans, uh, I think, yeah, Korean universities' collaboration, I think it was with Samsung, they're also developing patches that would be able to sit on your skin and, for example, detect the levels of glucose and release uh, insulin whenever you need it. These things are starting to happen. So the promises that nanotechnology did 20 years ago, 30 years ago, are only now started to happen. In the meantime, people were trying to do something else. So once uh, we had access to see DNA at the nanoscale, there was a guy in New York, Ned Seaman, who thought who was actually going to lose his tenure because he was not getting any good results. And he thought, OK, I'm trying to get crystal structures of DNA and information. I can't do it. But um, he started to think of DNA as a building block. Actually, he says that he saw this picture by Escher, who actually his half-brother was a crystallographer, and that's why he was creating these pictures that look like crystals. And he saw, he saw this sort of robotic fish, the four tails. And he thought, and they match with each other, perhaps I could build something with DNA like that, that would match like perfectly another bit of DNA like that, and I could create a structures. He started a field called as DNA nanotechnology, whose interest is on building any structure with DNA. But in this case, DNA doesn't have any genetic interest. All they have is a building block, like a building block like Lego. Uh, the field of DNA nanotechnology, as I take uh, in the book, became visible when DNA origami was invented because uh, there was a guy in Caltech who found that you could get any string of DNA from a virus, create a staples in the computer, and get your initial string to fold in literally any shape you wanted. This was one of the initial dreams of nanotechnology, create self-assembled structures that you could design in a computer. These days, people do 3D structures of all sorts of shapes with DNA, cubes, little teddy bears, these are real things that people do. So nanotechnology is becoming an established field, DNA nanotechnology, in which people are able to build all sorts of structure. Now, the main problem of DNA nanotechnology is what do we do with these structures? They're very nice and they're very small, but it's difficult to use them in any practical application. Again, they're being thought as useful material uh, for um, DNA nanomedicine. This is one of my contributions to the field. I work with this Japanese scientist to make these DNA handles that could assemble on cells. And our idea is that perhaps we could use these handles to pull from the cells, but it's very unclear how we can do that. Andrew Torrifil in Oxford and other people have managed to make something very interesting with DNA, which is to make DNA as a track where you can assemble drugs. One of the main problems of drug development and pharmacology is not only that when you have a drug, you don't reach the target. And even if you reach the target, the cells get rid of it. Is that it's very difficult to produce new drugs because there's limits to synthetic chemistry. So what these guys do is to use DNA, a little bit like the molecules I was showing you before, to grab and twist molecules so they can produce chemistry in an easier way. It's coming finally to the general press, to my surprise, last week in the Times, people were talking about DNA nanotechnology, and they mentioned my book, and <laughs> which made me even happier. Maybe that's why I saw this. No, but it was um, nice to see that for the first time, uh, the, the general press is looking at DNA. In this case, it was reporting a beautiful result of people that were trying to bind viruses, not just by making a single molecule, but by making a very complex star-shaped molecule that would just really grab 
viruses. What I thought it was beautiful is about this idea is that our body does that. Our body not only uses DNA as genetic material, our body, actually your immune cells, when you have a sepsis or a very big infection, they explode themselves. So they create networks of DNA in your blood vessels and they can trap the bacteria. So in a way, we are discovering something that uh, evolution, of course, has discovered many, many, many millions of years before us, that DNA is not only a genetic material, but it's also a structural material. Uh, other people are trying to do the same thing with proteins. Uh, so this is a much more powerful way of doing nanotechnology because you can literally create any shape out of the protein. And this is already a different game. DNA, nanomedicine, the still in this reductionist approach I told you at the beginning. Building blocks, simple ideas, targeting single molecules. But in the case of the uh, protein nanotechnology, things are different, a little bit different. For many years, people were dreaming of having a computer program that would be able to predict the, pro the shape of the proteins once you know the gene where it comes from. This had been impossible. He thought it was an impossible problem because proteins have very complex structures and computers don't have enough power. Or so they thought. It was just a question of power. So these guys started to do a lot of uh, crowdsourcing, getting the computers of many people, computers all over the world. It's actually a beautiful program, the Rosetta project, to try to compute the protein structures. And uh, eventually they succeeded. They have a competition. And for the first time ever, the, the people that were competing were given a sequence of genes. And one group, David Baker's group, came up with a correct structure. The reason they have a program that will predict the correct structure is not because they have better computer programs and better physics in the program. They had something different. They had encoded in the program evolution. And this is something that I think it had never been done before. To create a new structure, understand a new structure, you don't only go with brute force with physics. In the case of very complex biological structure, you need to take into account the evolution, the genetic history of where things come from. This changes the game, the conceptual game. We're not trying anymore by brute force to get building blocks and see how they assemble together. We're taking into our calculation the evolutional history of the Earth. We're taking, we're starting to embed in our thinking emergence, which I find very beautiful. And of course, once you be able to create start predicting proteins in your computer, the first thing that people thought is, ah, but now we can design proteins. So they went to the computer, designed proteins that don't exist in nature, and then they created a gene to encode for the protein, and they put it back in yeast or a bacterium to use the bacterium to create your protein, and they succeeded. They succeeded in very robust proteins, uh, but they manage, again, a very different way of fabricating. This is not like DNA nanotechnology. It's not building blocks and physics coming together. What you're doing here is to use the building power of nature. You're using a cell. We don't know how the cell does it, and we don't care. But we can use the power of the cell to create atomically precise materials. And I think this is the biggest game changer that is happening in science right now. And I will give you a few examples in other sciences. We are moving away from building blocks and physics. And we're trying to take into account complexity, the complexity of our evolutionary history, and also the complexity of the living world around us to create new ways of doing technology and indeed new ways of doing computation. Another wonderful thing this group did was to create a virus out of proteins that don't exist in nature. So they create proteins that are like the proteins of a virus, and then they put RNA that encodes for that protein, and they let it assemble, and they put it in a cell culture. It assembled in the cell culture, and it started evolving. So that means by using the building principle of nature, you can start creating technology that evolves with time. This is, again, a very different way of thinking of technology. In the meantime, biological physicists like me were starting to think deeper about the nanoscale and the origin of life, and not only the origin of life as a physics, classic physics, movement, a structure, what I saw you at the beginning, engineering principles, but maybe thinking deeper, 
why Earth created life, why life emerges from the nanoscale, and what life always, always has to be related to information and storage, to computer power. So for us these days, DNA, and this is a movie of DNA, is a very different molecule. So if you think, or I think, as a, bio, as a biophysicist, life on Earth emerged from polymers, from proteins, from DNA, because, as you know, the universe, you probably heard, in the universe, um, entropy always grows. Yet, we are built from the opposite, for removing entropy from becoming more order. How is this possible? Because when you're a polymer and you're wriggling in water, you can become folded and more complex folded if you dissipate energy into the environment. This is what in physics we call non-equilibrium thermodynamics. That means that if you fold and persist and become more complex, the only way you persist is by encoding in yourself information about your environment. The environment makes you. You are entangled with the environment, and the entanglement is the information. In our structure, it, what comes from the very universe that creates us is the information about the universe. This is, again, a very different way of looking at biology. And as I will tell you later, I think it changes the way we will do technology. Our techniques increasingly don't let us look just as proteins or a DNA. It lets us understand how DNA and proteins assemble in living cells, and indeed, how organisms develop. This is a fly an embryo of the fly, and the movie is showing you how the cells of the fly move and differentiate, become different in shape as the, as, the, as the fly, as the embryo starts growing. So as you can see here, we're moving now to a place where we start linking all the scales of biology, from DNA to protein to cell to organ development, and we're entangling all our abilities from physics chemistry, mathematical modeling, um, simulation, and as I told you before, and increasingly we will be becoming more and more important, we will embed evolution in our way we look at life. So one of the theses and, and the things I talk about in the book is that nanotechnology allowed us to bring physicists to look at, at molecules in, in the living environment. And from the convergence of sciences that this provoke, has allowed us for the first time to embrace, at last, biological complexity. And this goes beyond just medicine, but goes beyond the way we interact when we understand ourselves. There are wonderful convergence happening. It's not only physicists looking at biology, mathematics, um, simulation. We all come in together to solve the problem of life. Meanwhile, in computer departments, something similar was happening. For many years, people were trying to create algorithms that were able to translate. I started myself on that field. I did computational linguistics in the 1990s, or to recognize faces. And they all failed for many, many years until the neural networks started to become very powerful and we started to get in the news that a computer was able to play chess better than humans, then go, then translate, then recognize people. The reason this happened is because the algorithms also abandoned the reductionist approach. We didn't know anymore how the algorithm works. What the algorithm was doing was to mimic in the structure, the layer structure of our brain. So uh, machine learning algorithms, and, and especially neural networks, having is a structure an imitation inspired by our own brain um, that is able to recognize, and we still don't know how and why they recognize. So physicists like me, well, maybe more clever than me, Max Tegmar, think that the reason that deep neural networks are very good at recognizing the world is because they reproduce the structure of the universe. So let's go back to my DNA picture I told you before. DNA and biology is able to get into as a structure information about the environment so you can survive. You become a computer of survivor. And our brain, which is connected with all our parts of the body, encodes in itself all the evolutionary history of Earth, all our entanglement with nature to be able to survive so we can recognize the universe that created us in the first place. So we're in a moment 
where we're doing computing in a way that we didn't do before. We're starting to build technology in the way we never did before. We're building with nature, with the complexity of nature in which we still don't understand. Um, I'm skipping this. And this is a beautiful thing that I don't think my videos play. Um, I was got, showing you other examples of, of new computing that people are trying to understand. What you have here in the video that doesn't play is the map of the Tokyo underground. The thing is that this map is not made out of ink on paper. It's built by slime uh, mold. This is a type of mold that works on wood. And people have found out that if you put food, for example, here, in the, hub, in, the, in the main hubs of the Tokyo train stations. Um, the mold, just because it's a mold and has a structure and grows and wants to feed itself, is able to compute the minimum paths between those places in the map. Because embedded in living organisms is the capacity to compute, um, as I, I was telling you before, in this case, for feeding. And people are starting to look at these biological computers to look for, for ways of uh, solving complex mathematical problems. And people, again, are getting inspiration from this to, comp to build new algorithms, new maybe machine learning algorithms that, that uh, integrate all this information. But it's not only living organisms that are able to compute. This is a radical experiment that was done by Jim Jimseski in, in UCLA. He was also one of the pioneers of a scanning probe microscopy. And what he did was to get a plate full of nanowires of silver and created a massive networking between the nanowires, really highly interconnected. And then he started feeding the patterns of the traffic of Los Angeles on this way with electrical signals. As the signals go through, this thing learns. Why? Because you're so small that the signal going through you changes your own structure. As I told you with the DNA, the environment changes you. And if they feed you information, suddenly, after, after a while, after a few days, the device would start to predict the patterns of the, of the, uh, of the traffic in Los Angeles. So what we're learning here is that the universe encodes in complexly interconnected matter that is receiving signals from the outside world, electrical signals, mechanical signals, chemical signals, the capacity of computing. Again, we see this in immunotherapy. Drugs are not working with, with uh, chemotherapy efficiency is, very li is limited, in some cases very limited. But most of the treatments that have been put together in the last years and that have been approved for use in humans are immunotherapy. Why? Because this is, again, a non-reductionist approach. We're not targeting a single gene. We're not targeting a single protein. We use the immune system of our body, our whole cell, the computer power of the whole cells to keep disease. Nanotechnology finally is becoming useful because while nanoparticles are very bad at killing tumors or not so good, they're very good at targeting uh, the cells of the immune system because they accumulate in our spleen. That means nanoparticles can be used as a kind of vaccines or trainers of the immune system so the immune system can go and attack the tumor using cells, not just molecules. And that's why we have the results we have in these days with immunotherapy, with many people getting complete reversion of their tumors and their, and their cancers. People, nanotechnologies are also creating nanoporous materials that work as cancer vaccines. So you create a little material that you implant near your tumor, and this is full of information from the immune system of your body to, so that it recognizes cancer cells and gets rid of them. This is what you could call an implantable cancer vaccine. This is under clinical trials right now. And the last example where I'm telling you the combination not only of nanotechnology, but all this new science that is emerging in the 21st century that puts together computers, uh, mathematics, physics, and indeed non-reductionist uh, approaches to technology are changing the game. So, of course, it's always been a dream of medicine to be able to replace disease organs or organs that we lose. And this is something that humans cannot do. Uh, when you, your tissues 
are usually built of a lot of nano cables and cells embedded in the nano cables. This is the nano cables are uh, collagen and, and other proteins of your body. So the cells stick to them and they feel all their mechanical and electrical environment around them. When you have a disease, what happened, oh sorry, when you have a scar, for example, this information at the nanoscale is broken, the cells don't have information how to fill in the, the gap, they start changing the structure there, they start churning collagen and you end up with a scar tissue. So what we are learning in the last 20 years is that cells, you can control the way cells behave if you give them mechanical and even electrical signals. So uh, there was a beautiful experiment done many years ago already that showed that you got a stem cells the same kind of stem cells, and you put them, for example, on a plate as hard as bone or a plate as soft as brain, and you left them, these cells, one would turn into bone and the other one would turn into a brain cell. So people are trying uh, to construct materials that would steer cells to behave the way you want so you can create artificial tissues. So there's been some success with cartilage, the press, the press you study, reports uh, experiments of trachea transplantation. In this case, you get tracheas from a donor. They're not artificial. You remove the cells, and then you can reimplant them. Um, you can insert the cells of the patient and then reimplant it, and you get very high success. Uh, there's new materials that are also starting to be able to reconnect nanomaterials, to reconnect uh, spinal cord injuries. And perhaps the most interesting is that people are starting to be able to 3D print organs using combinations of materials and cells and to use and reproduce organs on a chip. These organs on a chip are useful, we think, to understand how organs communicate with each other in the body and also for drug testing. So just to, to confirm what I was predicting in my book a couple of weeks ago, the first liver on a chip uh, has been useful to uh, identify toxicity in human rat and dog models of drugs. This, the hope of this is that we will not need animal testing in the future uh, for doing your drugs or a bit much more reduced. So the picture I'm getting you here is that medicine is moving towards a world where we will be able to continue or better monitor what is happening in your body, targeting better the things that happen in your body, and it will be <laughs> Uh, the measurements will be a combination of nano, probably cells, combining our reductionist approaches with the emergent approaches of using whole cells. There will be more mathematical model that includes machine learning, neural networks, and indeed the evolutionary history, what I call here a smart mathematical model. And somehow, I was talking the other day to some audience, thought we're getting closer to the dream of traditional medicines. So if you know a little bit of Chinese medicine, you know that what Chinese medicine is telling you is that the whole body is connected, that physics is important, that you cannot disentangle yourself from the environment. And the methods of traditional medicine are usually, for example, getting your pulse, someone very trained to understand how your whole body is behaving. So all, this all the things I've been telling you before actually are taking us to a very smart version of all that, trying to get a lot of signals with very clever machine learning and algorithms to understand better what is going on in your body. One of the things I discuss in the book is that all this development, what is bringing us is to the blurring of the, of the uh, boundaries between material sciences and biological sciences. So people like me will be using nanotech, nanoparticles to study biology, and then I will use the principles of biology to create thin materials that don't exist in nature um, by understanding how we can get computers with nanowires and computers with the slime molds, we might create things that don't exist now at all. And I want to show you this beautiful example. is a stingray, cyborg stingray, that was uh, built by Kevin Kidd Parker in Harvard. It's made of plastic. And inside of the plastic has a lot of hard cells that have been cultured from a mouse. And the thing is able to follow the light and is being computer simulated to have the shape and the thing can move and it can swim. I think this is quite a prediction of the devices we will have in the future. You have computer, you have modeling, you have emergent phenomena, you have cells, you have polymers all in one. People are doing similar things, for example, in IBM, where they're making computer chips that not all, they are not anymore top-down, but they're also getting 
uh, the information uh, from, from just the structure of what you're putting there. So to summarize a bit uh, the <laughs> topics of my talk, uh, I just say that um, in the 21st century, we have a convergence of science and technologies and biology that is changing the way we're thinking about technology, the way we think about computing, and the way we think about medicine, and that more and more we are emerging with complexity in computing, in, in, in materials, etc. So I tell you a little bit what I do, and with that I will finish. So I work here in the physics department, and I work in many projects involving uh, at, um, nanotechnology, atomic force microscopes, and, and biological systems. I'm interested in plants. I'm interested in how plants grow and how they create their shape. With Antoine Jerusalem in the Department of Engineering, we're interested in how neurons couple mechanical and electrical signals to function to see if we can use uh, ultrasound to treat conditions such as epilepsy. I work with people in engineering department also to create materials for tissue engineering and even little micro robots that can be used for moving things around in biology. Uh, Casey, who is sitting here, is working in my lab and, and collaborating with Sarah Waters, also here, in understanding how uh, pancreatic tumors actually kill you with physics, with nanostyle physics, and we're trying to see if we can treat them to reverse the deadly physics. And I'm starting also to work on the uh, physics of cryopreservation, how we can create, um, uh, how we can freeze materials and in, 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 uh, they can survive. I also make biosensors. So this is a work I'm doing with Osaka University in Japan to detect viruses with um, graphene transistors. And to finish, I, I show you a little bit about uh, how my work in plants is leading me to work with other people. So this is a plant and this is how a plant grows. Plants are very clever because they can move and they don't even have a brain, but they'll survive. They su the, the longest things that are surviving on Earth are trees. And they don't have brains and they cannot even run away when the weather is bad. And the reason is because they have amazing survival computing powers in their structure. So in their shape, and all they have is shape, they're able to encode all the information that allows them their survival. So I'm very interested in how plants create their shapes. And when I was working on my plants and my shapes, I made a, well, I talked to a friend of mine, which is a sculptor, and he was asking me uh, about, he wanted to change the materials of his uh, sculptures, I think, and he was asking me about graphene. And his question got me thinking in something I had never thought before. I'm obsessed with medicine and applications in medicine, but I never thought of constructing big with nanotech. All I know about constructing big with nanotech is polymer composites, the sort of things that you make your surfboards with or of uh, fiberglass, but how you make um, something as clever as a plant? Can you make artificial plants? So I was looking at his uh, sculptures, which he has in a park in Japan, and funnily enough, they have the dimensions of my plants, I think because he knows he was trying to get them to grow in the shape of a plant. And I told him, I can't build you anything of nanotech that is good enough um, because it doesn't exist. We can't make a nanomaterial that creates the amazing mechanical properties of plants. Um, so I started thinking about wood and how wood is built. So wood is made of little tubes of cellulose. So cell as the plant grows, the shape of a plant is given by cellulose structure. So the pressure builds from the bottom of the plant, and the plant is pumped, extended, to create its shape just by creating structures with nanowires of cellulose. And then eventually, when you create wood, this solidifies. So you create an amazing nanomaterial that is able to do all sorts of shapes and endure thousands of years. Some buildings are built you know, in Norway or in Japan that are thousands of years old, and they still survive, and they're made of wood. So I started to think, can we really construct materials? Again, I started to question the things I was questioning you before. Do our reductionist approach good enough to construct the materials of the future? We need to get uh, rid of concrete. We need to get rid of a steel if we are going to save the planet. How do we build the materials of the future? So I started to think of turning wood 
into something interesting that doesn't exist in nature, but just the structure. So I uh, started thinking about making, for example, transparent wood. This is part of the work we're doing in the lab. So this is a chunk of red oak and we managed to remove the lignin and we can get it to be translucent. And then we refill it with a resin. Uh, by doing that, we, came in, we create a material that is translucent or transparent and has better mechanical properties of wood. So we're mixing our scent with nature and also better thermal proteins, properties than wood. And actually, uh, a friend of the sculpture, which is an architect who works for Almanda Levent Architects in London, who may, you may know for the extension of the Victorian Arbor Museum, asked me if I would give them some ideas because they had been invited to the Venice Biennale of Architecture, and I convinced them to do this. So if you go to Venice in next year in, in May, you may see my first structure that is built a bit like Nano comes to life. So to finish, I will make a reflection of what does it mean beyond technology. So uh, for most of the 20th century, biology, we were looking at biology, talking about genes and talking about proteins like everything else, something we could modify. We could modify nature, we could produce agriculture, just we, we didn't need to think about what we do with the soil. We had this idea that our uh, molecules will save us, but actually we're living now in the moment when medicine is stagnated, unless we think differently, and indeed we have the climate emergency, which is not brought over by this idea of using our technology, just not with nature, but over nature. So I think one of the most important uh, um, consequences of doing physics, biology in the physics department, is what I told you at the beginning. We are confronted with the idea that biology did not emerge separate from nature. The universe created us. We are entangled with the universe. Our intelligence emerges from the entanglement with the universe. And that the best technologies we can create in the future will be entangle our intelligence with our environment. So I do think it changes the way we look at nature to transform the way we just do things over biology, like we have seen these days with this guy in China that was doing CRISPR cars in the genes of these poor babies, and now it turns out today in the press that he didn't even modify the genes he wanted to do. Or we can actually work with nature in a different way that addresses nature's complexities and the complexities of humans' entanglement with nature. Uh, to change the way we do uh, technology and medicine in the future. So I also think uh, this will bring us a new relationship with the arts. Because what I've been telling you is that we are redefining what we mean by intelligence, what our intelligence comes from. And that means we have a new relationship with culture. Questions that we couldn't answer before and they could only be answered through the arts, perhaps we will start to be able to pose them with our science. So I finish again with one of the sculptures of my friend, because I think um, abstract sculpture is a very good place to inspire us for the future. Because in abstract sculpture, you have the emotion of the artist represented, or whatever is trying to, to show, uh, in matter, in a structure. And in the future, we will be able to actually start to understand how intuition or emotion emerge from the complexity of biology. And I think a sculpture and the arts will be very important in interrogating the new science that will be coming uh, from our labs. So I think in the future we're going to see not even more mergers between sciences, but we're going to have more mergers between the sciences and the humanities which I think was one of the purposes of writing my book. So to show you that I'm not joking, this is the sculpture, and this is one of the protein structures created by the protein nanotechnologies. They match, and I don't think it's by chance. It's, I think, because humans, we create similar structures, whatever we try to do. So I finish with a sentence of my book, which summarizes the intention of the book. Nature and history are inviting us to communicate and interact with the world in a deeper way, and hence to expand, to expand the human capacity to connect with the universe in a more fruitful way. And thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Sonia, for an absolutely fascinating, stimulating, revelatory uh, presentation, and um, one which leaves me in huge hope, uh, not least that we might be able to deal with cancer and many, many other things, but also join up different areas of discipline. Um, we've actually run out of time. You took your full hour. Uh, the no, good, there's five the, the, minutes the, the, in my computer. There's five minutes. Okay, three minutes. Uh, just one question, and I see down at the back. Um, yeah. And um, give a short answer because that is between leaving, people yes, and drinks yes, and yes, selling your I book. Know, I know. So <laughs> okay. I know. So you, you mentioned that David Baker had won this contest on synthesizing proteins. Not by synthesizing, predicting the structure. Predicting the structure of proteins by using evolution. Yeah. But you didn't explain why. I'd be very curious if you could explain yeah. the, what did he actually do, in what way yeah, did he use evolution? Yeah, it's a complicated thing. So for a long time, people were just trying to get, you know, your structure, and then you just get the electrostatics between them and the physics between them and how it would fall, and that didn't work. So what he did was to look, because we don't have information, a lot of information about the structure, you don't have information about the structure, so you know what bits are coming together. So what he did was to study the evolutionary history of those proteins in many, many, in, in those gene sequences before, and then trying to see what genes were evolved together. And by figuring that out, you can start to figure out uh, if they were near each other or not. And if they were near each other, maybe the bits on your protein are near each other. So the thing of biological structures is that because they have been created by evolution, they're not just physics. Physics is part of it. But the whole structure comes because it works. It works in the environment and encodes what came before you. So you need to take into account the evolutionary history of your genes in order to predict the structure, which I think is very revolutionary. And I think it's just the beginning of something we're trying to learn that in our algorithms for prediction, perhaps we need to bring in all the evolutionary history of, 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 of life on Earth. Because we don't come from a vacuum. And physics alone is not enough, like if you seek with DNA nanotechnology. With physics alone, you can be very beautiful teddy bears and things like that. But if you really want to be a virus, you need to do proteins, because proteins have evolutionary history in them. Even your artificial proteins, because you're using the cells to produce them. That's why I think it's a very radical new way of thinking about computing and also technology. And uh, we're just starting to understand what it means, I think. Well, Don, who runs the complexity group in the Oxford Martin School, yeah, is a good person to have this conversation. Yeah, I know, with. that's right. Um, so that really was uh, fascinating. Of course, there's much more in the book. I don't know how you managed to, but you convinced Princeton University Press, which I never succeeded in doing, putting wonderful color plates in oh, it there as well. You go. Um, so uh, it's a bargain, uh, and there's huge amounts in it. Sonia, thank you very much. Please do join us for a drink and uh, get a copy of the book right behind you. Thanks to you all for coming. Thank you.